everybody, Dr. Ryan here. I'm a board certified specialist hospitalist. Thank you for joining me in episode 7 of our OSCE series. We're talking about the infamous diabetic amyotrophy. Oh, if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I strongly encourage you to hit that subscribe button. Alrighty, so this is the stem of our question. We have a 45 year old male with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Mm -hmm presenting with an acute onset of pain and weakness in his right thigh. Hmm. So, the questions are as follows. What is the diagnosis for one mark? And outline clinical features. Secondly, outline the concept of motor neuropathy and its subtypes in the context of diabetes mellitus for five marks. Then, outline clinical features of autonomic neuropathy in the context of diabetes for five marks. Hmm. Alrighty, let's get going guys. What's the diagnosis? So this is diabetic amyotrophy, especially involving the right thigh. Right, we can see that there's wasting on the right compared to the left. Both are actually wasted, but the right more so than the left. What are the features of diabetic amyotrophy? Well, it usually presents acutely in a patient who has type 2 diabetes who is poorly controlled with raised glycated hemoglobin, but not known with any microvascular disease. That's a big tip off. It initially manifests with asymmetrical weakness of the hip or knee, as we can see depicted here. What we have is radicular pain, which means pain associated with a specific nerve root and or other sensory symptoms may be accompanied by hyporeflexia. It's often complicated by contralateral pelvic girdle weakness, wasting, weight loss, incontinence and impotence, right? And occasionally it's associated with an um, extensive plantar response and or raised CSF protein. The long-term prognosis is quite good. There's partial recovery usually within one to two years, though recurrence is not uncommon. Alrighty. Okay. So outline a motor neuropathy in the context of diabetes mellitus of five marks. This is our second question now. So this answer is adapted from Diabetic Neuropathies by Apana et al. Let's just get my pen in there. Um, so we can certify it five ways. There's large fiber neuropathy, small fiber neuropathy, proximal motor neuropathy, acute motor neuropathies, and then entrapment syndromes. So large fiber neuropathy occurs, um, you know, we have uh, variable sensory and motor deficit, but the first sensory modalities to go in sensory neuropathy is going to be vibration sense and then touch. Right, so you gotta always check, especially if you're doing a diabetic foot exam. Right, you want to check for vibration sense. So you get your 128 hertz tuning fork, and you get your monofilament and testosterone modalities, pain as well, as well as diminished uh, tendon reflexes. If it's small fiber neuropathy, it doesn't really cause much sensory loss, but it does cause something cause something called thermal allodynia. Right, pain is variable, but you hardly ever get a motor deficit in the context of small fiber neuropathy. With proximal motor neuropathy, you don't have much sensory loss. You have diminished tendon reflexes, variable pain, but you can have a proximal motor deficit, right? And that's what we talk about in the context of uh, lamosacral radicular plexopathy in the context of diabetic amyotrophy. Acute motor neuropathy is the classic one is the isolated third nerve palsy, right? Because remember, this is a papillary sparing lesion. Why? Because the motor fibers which innervate the pupil run on the periphery of the third nerve. So usually if you have a compressive lesion, right, we have pupillary involvement. But because diabetes causes ischemia to the center of the nerve, you'll have all the other manifestations of a third nerve palsy except the pupillary involvement. All right, so you'll have the partial ptosis and you have the eye being uh, down and out because of the unopposed action of the fourth and the sixth nerves, but you will not have pupillary involvement. Then entrapment neuropathy is usually the median nerve in the form of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. You can have ulnar compressive neuropathy, you can have lateral popliteal. It can also happen in the context of diabetes. Okay, now there are a whole truckload of autonomic neuropathies and diabetes to speak about. Let's get stuck in. Firstly, in terms of a vital signs, you can have a fixed resting tachy or a postural tachycardia. In blood pressure, you can have supine hypertension or postural hypotension, which is defined by a drop on systolic by more than 20 millimeters mercury or a drop on the diastolic by more than 10 millimeters mercury or moving from a seated to a standing position, right? Facial signs, you can have differential gustatory sweating, 
right? When the patient's eating, you notice that they are sweating more on one side than the other. The pupils, we can have Horner's syndrome, which as we know is ipsilateral ptosis, meiosis and anhydrosis cause of involvement of the autonomics in the cervical sympathetic region. You're going to get anisocoria as well. GI symptoms, very important, right? So epigastric pain can be on account of gastroparesis and delayed gastric emptying or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Patients may often present with nocturnal hyperdefecation or nocturnal diarrhea. You can have chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction which manifests with either constipation, which is usually the case, or diarrhea on account of bacterial overgrowth. You can have pain unawareness, and this underlies or underpins the clinical presentation of silent myocardial infarcts. Right. Diabetic patients don't classically get the typical angina associated with MIS, but what they complain of is predominant dysautonomic symptoms. So they can have diaphoresis, and they have a tachycardia, etc., but not necessarily the pain. So always have a very high index of suspicion in a patient who presents with diabetes and predominantly dysautonomic symptoms. They have loss of deep pain and loss of peripheral pain. Other functional losses in the context of autonomic neuropathy is hypoglycemic unawareness, especially in patients who are treated for the diabetes, strido and apnea, urinary retention, overflow incontinence, which is otherwise termed urgency, and then of course, one of the more popular complications is impotence or ejaculatory failure or retrograde ejaculation. Okay, my friends, the book of Hebrews chapter 3 verses 7 through 8 tell us, so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the times of testing in the desert. You know, when we read the account of the Israelites and Moses, when they went 40 years through the desert before they reached the promised land, there was a lot of complaining, a lot of murmuring that went on. Their hearts became hard. And as a result, a journey which should have taken them, uh, I think it was 30 days, took them 40 years. I pray that when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we will not harden our hearts but we will yield to him and surrender to him and allow him to work in our hearts and lives. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you soon with another handy video in this OSCE series. I hope you're enjoying it. Take care.